Okay, today I want to uh, share with you uh, uh, this topic called Talking to God First. Uh, this is the God First series. This is the third in this series. Right? The first uh, we have was to choosing God First. Right? Choose God First. And the previous week, uh, not last week, the week before last, uh, I spoke on experiencing God. And so today, uh, we will look at this topic called talking to God. Now, obviously, talking to God, we all of us know how to talk to God. Some of us talk more, some talk less, some don't talk. Right? But talking to God is about praying. And obviously, uh, in our midst today, they are, they are very seasoned Christian, means you may have been a uh, Christian, you know Christ for many, many years, and you are very experienced. Maybe you heard many, many messages about prayer, and maybe you can even preach better than me, but never mind. Right? And we also have uh, Christian brethren who perhaps know Christ not too long ago and that prayer to you may not be as clear uh, as those who have you know, many years of a Christian walk. So uh, I hope that through this uh, sharing, uh, we'll be able to make some clarification and also remove some misconception and also at the same time uh, share with you a few tips that how when we pray, God would listen to us. I think that's the key, right? Today, if I tell you the secret to answer prayer, what I tell you is full house. Right? Today, a lot of people want secrets. Right? Every time you say secret, wow, a lot want to come. So, well, God is with us here and uh, we 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 going to open this time with a word of prayer and then after that, we go straight into the message, shall we? So, Father God, we thank you for this afternoon. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we can gather to worship you. Lord, we want to come and commune with you. And at this time, Lord, we want to sit at the feet of Jesus' feet and to listen. So, Lord, hide your servant behind the cross and, and we commit this time relevantly to you. So, be with us and be with those who are online too. We give thanks and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Talking to God first, we, we need to constantly communicate with God, right? You know, I, I, some time ago, I read somewhere, I can't remember where, you know, uh, about these two persons, they, they, they share a, a room. They don't even share a house. They share a room. And, and these two persons hardly talk. These two persons hardly talk. And one day, after about, what, two weeks, the, the, the other, uh, you know, the, the, these two persons who stayed together realized that the other person, how come no noise? Uh, never hear anything. And only to, to his shock to discover that the person had died. You know, but don't ask me, how come no smell? That I cannot answer. Okay? So they don't even know because they don't communicate. Now, I don't mean that we are like these two persons. Right? So surely we do talk to God. Uh, but how do we talk to God? Now, communication is something that uh, is important that we want to communicate with God. In fact, right at the Garden of Eden, you realize that when God created man, God wants to communicate with man. God always come in the afternoon, like this time now, no? about 4 o'clock, have afternoon tea. It's called high tea. Garden of Eden star. Not, not, not uh, Orchard Hotel or Mandarin Hotel. You know? so, so God wanted to communicate. And, and that was the time where I believe that will be the sweetest hour in uh, Adam and Eve, you know, so-called Christian career. But it did not last too long. Right? After that, there was something happened, and then they were no longer be able to, to communicate with God that way, that, that personal, that intimate. Now, in 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it reads, First of all, then I urge that, entreaties and prayers, petition and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Now, Paul here obviously uh, urged all Christian brethren to pray, to pray, right? To pray for uh, people, for kings, for people in authorities. Now, obviously, do you include our loved ones? It includes matter that touch that we our hearts that we are concerned about. Right? So prayer is, in fact, one of the very important things as far as Paul is concerned. And today, before if there are something, if there's something happening in your life, will you talk to God first or will you talk to man first? Many a times, 
uh, when, when we are confronted with an issue, with a challenge, you know, to make an important decision, unfortunately, we seek perhaps experienced people, right? Uh, we speak people, people whom we respect, and then we, we, we find some counseling, you know, seek some counseling. There's nothing wrong about that, really. Nothing wrong about that. Because uh, to seek counsel is good. Uh, but if you only seek the counsel of man, and we never ever think about talking to God first. Now, perhaps after hearing this sermon, you may decide to do otherwise next time. Then, in fact, the first person that we want to talk to is God, to present to God the challenges that we are facing, the problems we, we are facing, right? that what man cannot solve. I can assure you that God has the way we do to solve. And, and that, let's not take prayer as the last resort. Now, sometimes like when, when all things, all else fail, then we think, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, still got God, you know, uh, still got God. Now, let's not be like that, right? Uh, because prayer is something also very boring. But actually, prayer is not boring. Just now when uh, Brother Al uh, oh, sorry, Alan, you know, sorry, I want to call him Andrew. Alan, when Brother Alan shared about, you know, uh, about Brother Lawrence, you know, the presence of God, practicing the presence of God. You know, why are we practicing the presence of God? When we practice the presence of God, we are actually in communication with God. In fact, it's a silent prayer. You know, it's a form of communication, a form of prayer that we do not talk too much, but we enjoy the, the very presence of God. So prayer is really not just about verbalizing it, that you have a lot of words, then that is prayer. You know, that's communicating with God. Because prayer is such a, 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 a wide, uh, subject, you know, that actually you may take more than one sermon, in fact, you may take uh, 10 sermons, you may not finish all aspects about prayer. But let's not take prayer as the last resort, but rather the first thing that we can do or we must do. I always talk to God. And we should make prayer a priority. In fact, priority to start the day. And see, each day when we uh, wake up, you know, what do we do? Brush our teeth, comb our hair, in fact, when you wake up, the first thing we should say, good morning, God, right? And you have to say, goodbye, God. See, we, we acknowledge God's presence. I don't know how you feel about your life. See, each day if we, when we wake up, hey, thank God, God. Thank God, God, I can breathe. I'm alive. Right? Think about one day when you cannot thank God and someone is preparing for you. Sounds funny, right? Eh? So, so, so appreciating God and, and make prayer a, a, a lifestyle, you know. Prayer can be very simple and you unfold this message, right? So make prayer a priority in our life. So communicate with God first. Secondly, I want to deal with some misconceptions about prayer. Uh, you may know a lot about prayer. There are many, many misconceptions I will uh, share with you for. Right? But I have four more significant ones. Firstly, my, some people think that prayer must be long and elaborate. No, prayer need not be long and elaborate. Jesus warned his followers not to be deceived into thinking that uh, long, worthy prayers would earn them God listening ear. See, sometimes we think that when you is long, then God would hear. No, Jesus told the disciples, now, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus said, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So, so Jesus, is, Jesus told the disciples that don't, you don't need to pray long, with a wine, you know, very long and worthy prayer. One, many years ago, uh, it was a funeral service, yeah, funeral situation, a barrel. And uh, the, 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 the person, the religious person who is doing the, you know, the funeral service was praying. Uh, you know how long it takes, the prayer? Under the hot sun, uh, in Zhuzhukang, 45 minutes. 45 minutes. So, so uh, 45 minutes is a long time, you know. And actually, 
not to criticize, but it was too long, right? So we need not pray that long. Having said that, let me also quickly say, it does not also mean that we don't spend long time in prayer. Spending long time in prayer and praying long prayers are not the same. Very worthy prayer, uh, they are totally different. Right? So we can in fact have a prayer feast. Right? You may have a prayer feast and then you spend hours just seeking the Lord. Right? But it's different from worthy prayer. And the prayer is very long and, and a lot of words. You know, prayer needs to be sincere more than the length of words. God is looking at our hearts. Right? God is not looking at our vocabulary. God's worthy prayer, in fact, many years ago, there was this person and his Christian friend all laughed at him and said, you know, uh, when this person pray, pray, you know, God has to check his English dictionary. Okay? So when this person pray, God has to turn out, what, what, what is he saying? His English word cannot find. So, so, Let's learn to come to God and, and pray, you know, meaningful prayer. In fact, there is such a thing called bullet's prayer. I don't know whether you have heard about it, you know, bullet's prayer. Very fast, no? Just direct. Sometimes you, you, you know, when Paul, or not Paul, when Peter was drowning, what kind of prayer did you pray? Oh God, the maker of heaven and earth, the creator of all things. You created Adam and Eve and then they sin, you know. And then you send Jesus Christ to die for them. And then he, from Genesis prayer to Revelation, Peter will drown. Peter only pray what? Lord, save me. Three words. Eh? Very effective. No? But, but we cannot all the time pray three words only. <laughs> Secondly, God doesn't hear your prayer if you sin. Is there such misconception that sometimes, uh, especially newer Christians, uh, you feel that we are in sin, and then when I pray, would God hear my prayers? You know, God hears the prayer of sinners. To, to prove a point, how did you become a Christian? When you pray to God, were you a sin when you accept Christ? No, all of us were sinners, right? And, and that was the first prayer. The first prayer when we were still a sinner, we said, Lord, I am a sinner. Right? I open my heart, I invite Jesus into my life and use the blood of Christ to cleanse me. And on that day, Christ answered our prayer. God answered our prayer. And, and so we are here. So God hears the prayer of sinners. See, in, in the Old Testament, you, you read the book of Judges, you notice something. The, the people in Israel at that time, or the people of Israel, they went through seven cycles, you know. Seven cycles of what? Sin, crying out to God. When they sinned, they were oppressed by the enemy. And then after that, they cried out to God. God delivered them. Then after that, they, they enjoyed all the peace and the prosperity. Then they forgotten God. They sinned again. Then the oppressor came, and then they cried to God. So this whole cycle repeat seven times. And who were praying? You know, when they were so close to God, when they were sinning, when, when the enemies oppressed them, and then they cannot tahan, you, know, you cannot take it anymore. Then they cried to God. See, God heard them. So God, it's not true that God would not hear the prayer of the people who are sinning. But let me also quickly add, if you and I are sinning, then we must also very quickly deal with the sin. Don't, don't let sin become a lifestyle. Although God does hear the prayer of a sinner and even prayer of people who are sinning, but that does not mean that we use that as an excuse and therefore we don't have to deal with our sin. We have to deal with our sin. And the sooner we deal with it, the better it will be. In fact, someone said, keep a short account with God. And in Hebrews, 727 says, though we are forgiven our sin that once for all by Christ Jesus, we continue to sin at times. So it is not possible that Christians uh, stop sinning. There's no sinless, uh, uh, what you call, no sinless sin around. We, we are seeking glorification. We are seeking to become more and more like Christ, more and more holy. But we only can achieve that when we reach heaven. On earth, we will always struggle with this. 
Right. So, but God, let me assure you, God will hear your prayers. Right. So, continue to come and seek the Lord. Because uh, sin does not close the ears of God. Because God loves us too much to close His ears when sinners pray. pray. Thirdly, we must assume a certain position, I mean posture, for our prayers to be heard. See, in, 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 but in certain uh, institutions, in certain church, when they pray, uh, they, they have standard posture. Right? In some uh, traditional church, you sit in the pews, right, on the pews, and then they actually have a kneeling uh, kind of a, a pad, you know, and you can flip over, and then you can kneel, and then you pray. Well, well and good, but in our place here, you will kneel, you'll be hard, hard ground. Right? So, so praying, is there a fixed a posture that only when we kneel then God will listen and if we stand God will not listen or when we clap our hand when we prostrate then God will hear and actually prayer has no fixed position Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane I believe he was kneeling right, seeking the, 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 the will of the Father other time he was reclining at the dining table. You know, they, they don't have a table and chair, so they decline, recline, you know. Cleopatra star. And, and he prayed. David tells us in the Bible that he prayed what? He prayed prostrating. Meaning to say that prostrating is very serious, you know. It's, in Chinese, it's called Wu Ti Tou Di. Your nose touch, touches the ground. And then you literally lie prostrate. Now, sometimes this posture is up to a person. And normally we don't do it in church. Uh, because when you do it in church, you may think you are cuckoo. Uh, or very serious. But at home you can do it, right? At home you can really lie, uh, prostrate before the Lord. And, and, and you just pour out to God. And there are many postures. Whether we kneel, we stand, we lift up our hands, we sit down, you know, uh, it's okay. In fact, you can even lie on your bed and pray. But don't make that the fixed posture. <laughs> See, if you are sick and you are hospitalized and, and behind you there is a, a sign there say what? Restricted to what? In bed, right? You cannot move. Right? You, you are supposed to stay in, uh, in the bed. So what can you do? You have to lie on the bed. What? Well, can you pray? Obviously, you can pray. Because you are in that posture. God hears our prayer. It doesn't mean that it must be a specific posture. Or we must pray with our eyes closed because prayer is supposed to be very holy and you know, very solemn, right? So sometimes we pray with our eyes closed. But, but if you are driving, you also can pray. While you are driving, you can pray. And one of the best prayers to pray in, while you are driving is pray in tongues. Right? Uh, that, that is the best. But please, uh, when you are driving, don't pray with your eyes closed. Right? Otherwise, the next time you hear is a bang, and then you know someone will be praying for you. <laughs> so pray with your eyes open, right? So sometimes we pray with our eyes open. Sometimes we pray with our eyes closed, with our pray- hand raised or our hands, you know, in any other posture. So so you notice that in prayer we we can assume many many posture. There's no restriction. I think God is not looking at our posture more than He look at the posture of our heart. Because if the posture of our heart is not right, then all the physical posture means nothing. Means nothing, right? So, so, so you see, prayer can be so enjoyable. It is not like, oh, you need, when you uh, 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 assume this posture, then you're praying. No. See, any way we can pray. Right? Any time we can pray. In fact, I have a, a church meet many years ago. Uh, her brother, uh, actually kind of, uh, I cannot, I want to use a very serious term, pers- persecuting her. No, her brother was uh, making life very difficult for this sister. You know? And she could not, she, he would not allow her to come to church, would not allow her to do any Christian activity in the home. So, but this sister, she loves the Lord. And, and so she did her devotion, you know where? in the toilet. Because the toilet is the only place left that the brother cannot go in. Right? So she did her devotion 
brought her Bible into the toilet and did her devotion. So will God honor that devotion, you ask me? I say yes, right? Don't you think that it's better to do devotion in the toilet than the Bible laying in your room and collecting dust? So there's no virtue about the Bible in your living room and collecting dust than someone using the Bible in the toilet because of a very special circumstance, right? Otherwise, don't do devotion in the toilet. Please hear me correctly. Right? I think under normal circumstances, then we have the freedom you know, to, to do it beside the toilet. Don't do it in the toilet. Or at least you've got some respect. So, so we can go anywhere. And we can pray anywhere. We can pray, you know, uh, not restricted by certain posture. I remember when I first became spirit-filled. You know, at that time, I, if you look at me, I did a little bit cuckoo, you know. That was many, many years ago. Just now when Ellen announced, you know, 19 years old, you can join. I was 19 years old, but 50 years ago. So, oh, that was about 50 years ago, you know, when I was filled with the spirit. And, and I become, you know, I must tell you, uh, I, at that time, I was like a 13 years old, 14 years old kid, uh, infatuated. Uh. You know, have you gone through infatuation before? I see only a few uh, really honest people. How about the rest? See, when you are in infatuation, uh, Luke, listen very carefully. <laughs> see, you, 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 you are really excited because you have never fall in love before, right? Wow, you are very hot, lah, you know? But, but it's like hot potato, no? After a while, you throw it away. Right? So that's called infatuation. And someone said this, infatuation will lead to puppy love. Boom, puppy love will lead to a dog's life. <laughs> that's called puppy love, okay? Puppy love will lead to a dog's life. So I was filled with the spirit. And, and, and then we were meeting in a church in uh, Mount Sophia, uh, Church of Malaya, and they have the pew, you know? So, so when I went to church, uh, you know, I'm very holy. You know. I will flip the kneeling pad down, and well, I'm the only one. I'm the only one kneel down and pray. And everyone looked at me, this cuckoo guy. But at that time, I don't care, because I was really filled with the Spirit. I was spiritually revived, and I just don't care. But the thing back, I actually no need to show off. La. You know? <laughs> so, so, but it's like that. Sometimes in life, it's like that, right? Posture. So it's not really, I, then I thought that well, kneeling is the best posture. But no, not really. Like, kneeling is good, but ne not necessarily the best posture. So, so let's be very natural. I think the important thing is we have the right posture in our heart. Right? Fourthly, prayer, so, someone thinks that prayer ought to be, ought to use a lot of great sounding Christian jargon. Oh, means special. Jargons are uh, specialized words. Uh, you know, like lawyer will use models of brandy, you know. Uh, and you see, sometimes you go to the law court, I mean, you go to a court, the lawyer use Latin. Uh, those are jargons. Uh, the Latin that you don't know. You really have to check dictionary, right? And, and sometimes when you use this jargon, it sounds very spiritual. Now, especially English congregation. Chinese congregation, I think less. English congregation, sometimes when we pray, God, you know, you know, we use justification, glorification, sanctification, then after that, all confusion. Uh. Right. But what is sanctification? What is glorification? What is justification? It means nothing what, if no one understands. Right? So it doesn't mean that we must use Christian jargon and then God would hear. And maybe along this, you know, I would digress. Some people, when they pray, they tend to assume an ecclesiastical tone, you know. You know it's an ecclesiastical tone? Today, let's come and pray before the Lord. You know? well, that is an ecclesiastical tone. Because the moment you hear, you know, it's very holy already. Straight away, you must tie. <laughs> it's called an ecclesiastical tone. Now, it doesn't mean that you must use this tone, you must use jargon. How about we simple men or women? Right? When we, we, we use the market language. Not everybody is is so educated that when they speak English, it's queen's or king's English, right? You, you notice something? Our, our, our first prime minister, you see, his English is super good, you know. He can go to England parliament and speak, and all of the, the Englishmen, uh, the ear oil also will flow out, you know. His English is that super good. Eh? But then when he speaks in the rally, you know, at uh, you know, not Fullerton Square, 
when he speak at a rally in Fullerton Square, he used what? He will use the market language, okay? If he goes to a, a rally, he will use a language that the crowd understand. If he speaks a language that the crowd did not understand, he will never get the votes. But when he went to the English Parliament, he must impress the lords, right? He must impress all the lords, you know, all those uh, politi politicians and all, all these very, very educated people. So he cannot use the like, Sakali, you know, you know, and then, you know, he cannot use Sakali there. He must use the proper English. So, so you see, jargon, God is not impressed with jargon. More than God is interested in how we communicate to him. Based on our background, and some of us may not even be able to speak English in a proper way. We may not be able to string a sentence, an English sentence without grammatical errors. Right? So if today, if I, I don't speak perfect English, I want to tell you this. I want to continue to learn to make sure that my English will improve, but I'm not ashamed with my English. Sometimes we see a, oh, I say this, may I may hurt some people. You see an Englishman speak Mandarin. Oh, you all, oh, you oh, know, like as if. But you forget that one Englishman speaks Mandarin, we all, oh, and ah. Then we have 100 Chinese who can speak English, no one impressed. <laughs> Funny, right? So, so do not get embarrassed. Do not be embarrassed with even the, the command of English you have. You see, we are, we are not Englishmen, right? We learn a second language. In fact, I can be so proud. Take an Englishman, come out, and then we compare how many languages you can speak. I can speak Hokkien, Cantonese, Teochew, Hakka, Hainanese. At least go people one. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Take English, Mandarin. Oh, maybe Tamil, who knows? At least I know a few phrases. Um, um, a Malay only can count one to ten. And you ask an Englishman to come and show off? No. So we don't have to be embarrassed with the, the English we use. Because many people, I, I, I realize that in the LG group or in a cell group, huh, I say, brother, sister, please pray. Wow, the person very scared, no? Because the person is worried that, oh, my English is not good enough. You know, compared with what Ellen pray. Are you Ellen pray, you know? <laughs> Heaven's door open, no? I pray the door's locked. <laughs> so you are intimidated. No, we don't have to use jargon. What I'm trying to say is that God will, God will hear us. In fact, God is more interested that you open your mouth and pray than the, the perfect English that you can use. Right? So don't let jargon become a problem. You don't have to sound jargon. Remember many years ago when I first, I think about 32 years ago, I went to attend a, a, a kidney foundation seminar at IELC and a few speakers presented their papers. And one particular person, he, he presented his paper. You know, he, he, he read from his script. He read. And, and I can tell you this, he, he spoke about 20 minutes or so. I think I fall asleep for about 10 minutes. <laughs> then the other rest of the 10 minutes, I, I could not understand. By the time he finished, uh, I could not understand 5% of what he spoke. You know, because the English he used uh, is so specialized, so cheap, uh, that the ordinary man like me don't understand. So he has presented a great paper, but he wasn't communicating. You get me? He was presenting a great paper, but he wasn't communicating. Because I'm quite sure on that day, 90% of those in the congregation don't understand him. So, so God is not impressed with the jargon uh, that we use, the what Christian sounding words that we use, more than when we pour out our hearts to God. So especially for the younger Christian brethren, right? I want to encourage you. Next time you go to attend LGs, uh, etc., etc., you know, when you are asked to pray, then you just pray. You cannot then sprinkle with Hokkien. God understands Hokkien, by the way. Uh, you still cannot sprinkle a little bit of other languages. God still understands. See, in our culture, I think it's fantastic. Because we, 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 we sprinkle Hokkien. When we speak English, we've got Hokkien, got Malay, uh, uh, got Mandarin, you know. Uh, that, that actually, other races don't understand one, no? Only Singaporean and God understand. <laughs> so praise the Lord. See, God really loves childlike faith. And uh, we just need to pray like a child before God. Now, sometimes when we pray, we may not even have words, right? 
We may not even have words. Because there are sometimes we are so grieved, we are so troubled, we only can come before God and then just lay there or kneel there and then have to, you know, you, you literally like crying, sobbing, grieving. And, and Romans say this, that there's a time when there's a groaning, you know, a groaning. The groaning that the Spirit of the living God is inside us, helping us to pray. That we have no words that comes forth from our mouth. Prayer can be like that. And in fact, those prayers can be very, very true, very, very effective, very, very meaningful. Because no words. It, and, and that's an example. That's an example in the Bible. You remember Hannah? Hannah was despised by the husband, uh, first wife. She is the number two. Oh no, in Chinese it's called Xiao San. He was the next wife. You now he got two wives. Last time he can have two wives. Now cannot. Now please, man, don't, don't get excited. So, so, so Hannah was childless. And the, the other wife, wow, production line, very, very what, productive, you know? Boop, 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 boop. Wow, so many children. Then Hannah, oh, pray, 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 no children. And got despised. So the husband to compensate for her grief, give her double portion. The, 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 the other wife, even more angry. I give her so much, got so little. Even, cannot even lay one egg, give so much. So, so Hannah was grieved. And then Hannah went to the temple, right? And Hannah prayed before the Lord. What did the Bible say? Eli, the high priest, saw her. Eli only saw her lips moving. And no words came out. And Eli, the high priest, thought Hannah was what? Drunk. Because must be a drunkard woman that came into the sanctuary and prayed today. So he reprimanded her. But you see, Hannah's prayer was answered by God, right? There wasn't a lot of words. No shouting, no raising of voice, etc. But just moving the lips. It was a heart that was praying. So there are times where we have to lay still before God. When, when our mind is so troubled that our, our, we cannot even get the right words to come and present it to the Lord. I don't know whether you have gone through that kind of situation. Right. So don't judge prayer by the loudness, by the length, and also by the kind of words that we use. Because God knows. The Bible says that before we open our mouth and pray, God already knows. But it's good that although God knows, God still wants us to pray. See, just now Alan you know, mentioned that now it's good that when the children present gift to the Father, not that the Father needs it, but the, it's good that the Father receive it. You know? it. It's the same, you know. I, I, I know that my children will love me. I, I use the word wood, right? But it's so nice one day if my children come and give me a hug. Daddy, I love you. You know, it's real good, eh? Right? And I'm looking forward to I hope that they heard it online. <laughs> it's real good. Why? Not that I don't know that they love me. But it's sure good when they open their mouth and verbalize it. That's why husband listen very carefully. Every day, tell your wife, I love you. Huh? No, you don't do it. Your ladies don't want it. You pretend like, mm. see, why, why they, you mean the wife doesn't know that the husband loves her? The wife knows. I, I don't mean all husband. But some, I mean, there are many good husbands around, right? But it's sure good when someone who, who loves you and verbal and say, dear, I love you. It's sure a good one. So God wants to hear that. God knows. But it's good that we verbalize too. So let's do that. Thirdly, prayer affects three areas, three interests. Right? When we pray, actually three interests are involved. What are they? Firstly, uh, we have personal interests. See, have you ever wondered what kind of prayers does God listen to and answer? I think this is many, up in many people's mind, right? What kind of prayer I pray? Then, then God will listen. As Christians, we pray a lot for things, for people, uh, you know, for situations, etc. And God 
we will listen to our prayer if our prayer are aligned with God's interest too. But there is a personal interest. Because, lucky or not, we have, we have many issues in life, right? Whether it's health, finance, uh, career, you know, children, you know, family, etc. We have many needs. We have many personal interests. It's nothing wrong to pray for personal interests. Nothing wrong. It's very natural to pray for personal interests. However, when our personal interests co- uh, contradicts or collides with God's interests, now that's the trouble. Let me give you one example. Why some prayers are not answered? See, if you pray for, let's say, finance, this person is in uh, financial trouble, and so he asks, Lord, please bless me you know, with a good job so that I can have a decent pay, and then I can you know, overcome my financial difficulties. Good, God may answer that prayer. But then after that, you see, when the person is maybe jobless, the person comes to church, attend prayer meeting. Now, when God bless the person with a job, now got overtime. Now cannot come to attend certain other activity. Now, in that sense, there are certain interests of God being affected, right? So you have to decide. Our interest, God's interest. So, so you think God, how would God answer it? I don't know. Maybe God will say, I think it's better to keep you poor so that you'll be sane than keep you rich so that, you know, you, you become havoc. <laughs> you, you, we, 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 in fact, distance ourselves from God. So our personal interest, we have to balance this very, very carefully because God is really interested to meet our personal needs. In fact, if you read the Bible, you read the Gospel, how many times Jesus met the needs of those who are sick, who are poor, you know. You see, the, 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 those who are hungry, He fed them, right? Those who were sick, He healed them. And, and God is in the business of meeting our needs. However, we cannot just concentrate on our personal needs at the expense of God's interest too. God will answer our prayer. There's no doubt about that. Right? So, one of the criteria about God ministering to our personal needs is we, do we know the will of God? Now, always the will of God is a very big issue. I remember when I was a younger Christian, I bought books and after books to find out the will of God. And re- after reading all those books, I still do not know what is God's will. Right? I don't know whether you have this experience. Right? And honestly, it's again God's will. But after reading all the books, maybe my English was no good. Lah. Yeah, I used the word was. And I don't understand. <laughs> and after reading, reading, I'm still thinking, God, what is your will? You know? But we want to make sure that our will aligns with God's. Then our prayer will be answered. How about God's interest? Beside our interest, God's interest. Now in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 48-49, it said, If they turn to you with their whole heart and soul in the land of their enemy and pray towards the land you gave to their ancestor, towards this city you have chosen, and towards this temple I have built to honor your name, then hear their prayers and their petition from heaven where you live and uphold their cause. Now here is Solomon praying. Actually, I share this with you. Uh, when I was preaching on Jonah, right? Jonah prayed in the fish valley and he prayed about your holy what, temple. And, and here Solomon uh, urged the Israelites when he dedicated the temple after building it. It was a grand celebration. And on that day, he reminded all the people and he told the people, on that day when you all pray about the holy, the promised land, when you pray, for Jerusalem, the holy temple. And when you pray for the holy sanctuary, the, san- the, the, the temple, these two things, promised land, Jerusalem, the temple, then God say, God will hear their prayers. And Jonah did that in the fish valley. Now, today we live in the New Testament time. These are Old Testament scripture, I mean, passage. And, and in today's uh, context, what does the promised land, Jerusalem, and the temple represent? Right? I think that is uh, important. Now, we, the Holy Land 
the Jerusalem, all this represents the kingdom of God. Right? It represents the family, the, the Christian family. And, and this is through Christ. Right? Christ became our portion. Right? We are grafted into the kingdom of God. So, so now in the New Testament context, it is about the church. It's about the church family, about the kingdom. Like we pray for the HG group just now, right? I, I'm, I'm convinced that because we pray in alignment with God's will, will our prayers be answered? The answer will be yes, right? We are not praying just for our church to grow in number only, you know, to grow in number. Huh? No, we are praying to what? To share the gospel. There are two different things, you know. We are praying to share the gospel. We are not praying, Lord, just build our church, build our church. Not that building our church is wrong, you know. But that can be also selfish in a certain, to a certain degree. But what we are saying, God, we want to share the gospel. Will you not uh, tap God's heart? I believe so. So today, if we learn to pray according to God's interest, then God would answer our prayer. Because every prayer of us affect our personal interest, God's interest, and thirdly, it affects the devil's interest. The devil also has interest. Because when God's interest is advanced, the devil's interest is what? Disadvantage. Right? When more people enter heaven, then hell will be what? Bankrupt. When you draw near to God, then you will separate from the devil. So, so you see this contention? So there's no neutral ground. Some people want to please the devil, they also want to please God. Some want to please Russia, they also want to please Ukraine, and in the end, both of them whack them. Right? So we, we have to take side. Either God or the devil. But every time we advance God's interest, the devil's interest is at stake. And therefore, what would the devil do? Would the devil uh, so-called uh, fold his arm, you know, in Chinese called siu shou pang guang, so the devil is just idle around? No! The devil will definitely want to take action. The devil will want to what? Cause problem. That's why it's called spiritual warfare. Spiritual attack. Is it not true? You notice that when you love the Lord, you want to honor God, you want to serve the Lord, problem comes. In fact, I know people, when they were okay, you know, they accept Christ, the next day they got retrenched. It's very scary, right? Who wants to become Christian? But it's the devil's work. I, I, I have a friend. When she became a Christian, and then after Billy Graham crusade 1978, in this church here, upstairs, she wanted to serve the Lord. And you know what happened? Suddenly, she, she, the, the, the evil spirit just kind of possessed her. And she became so serious, you know, that every day she was... Imagine, uh, she worked in a big bank in Singapore, uh, the, the personal secretary of the number two man of the bank. Uh, and then she sit down there and do this. It's scary, right? You see, that's in a time when she wants to serve the Lord. She wants to be serious with God. It took us one whole year to minister to her. To minister to her. Why? When the moment you want to be serious with God, the devil will not let you go. The devil will start to work. Just like for couples, uh, Let's say, especially married couple and you have children. Right? You want to come to church. You prepare to come to church. Suddenly, your, your, your baby, Lao Sai. After Lao Sai, Lao Liu. Huh? Then you cannot come already. Why? It's going to prevent you from coming. Wa? When, when people want to go and do you know, act, uh, uh, deliverance ministry, yeah, someone you know, got, got some spiritual issue, and then they gather a group, and then they want to go, and suddenly turn on the, the, the ignition of the car. The car cannot start. Normally it can start. Only that day cannot start. Why? You, you think it all happened by coincidence? No! There are spiritual forces behind because there is an interest conflict. God's interest and the devil's interest. So we have to be prepared. But I have good news for you. When these two interests are in conflict, God wins. Right? See, a lot of people read Revelation. No? And a lot of people preach Revelation. Sometimes, as you preach Revelation, you, you get scared, you know, right? Because the horses start coming out. <laughs> well, this horse, that horse, uh, then after that, wow, you get so scared. Wow, then the tribulation, right? But you know something? 
in Revelation, uh, please, uh, before you read Revelation, uh, please go read the last chapter, can you not? Please read the last chapter and the last few verses first. After you have read that few verses, then you go back and turn to Revelation chapter 1 and then start to read. Uh, you'll be okay because the last few verses say this. Jesus won. Jesus won. Amen. Those of you who love football. Okay, anyone? A lot, uh, I think a lot. See, I have not in touch with football for a long time. I don't know which is the most famous club. Chelsea or Liverpool? You know? Let's say you, that these two clubs are vying for the, you know, uh, for whatever cup they have. Like, I can't remember what kind of cup they have. You know? And you, you are watching a repeat broadcast. You see, if you are watching live, uh, well, your heart, uh, boom, 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 boom. You don't know who wins, right? But let's say you watch repeat broadcast. And you are Chelsea, Chelsea friends, fan. And then you, you already read the newspaper. Chelsea won. 4 0. Uh, no, no. 4 3. Okay? 4 3. The last goal score at the last 30 seconds. Uh, then, then now, when you watch the you repeat show, uh, you watch the football game, uh, I tell you, uh, you don't care if, say, Liverpool, uh, well, Liverpool fought the first goal, Liverpool fought the second goal, Liverpool fought the third goal. Well, then you say, well, chum down, chum down. But you really know the result. The three goals, because they will fall four goals. You know it really, right? So when you watch this game, you will not be what? Troubled by the initial happening because you know the end result. So, so you see, we are on the winning team. We are on the winning side. So even when we do spiritual warfare, we are more than conquerors, the Bible says. So we don't be afraid of the devil. Right? So even there is this spiritual contention, this spiritual you know, resistance, we are winners. We are more than conquerors. Some define more than conquerors is this, no? Who is more than conqueror? Mike Tyson, he won the boxing match. When he went home, the wife said, where is your payback? Okay. You know, so, so Mike Tyson handed 10 million over. Mike Tyson is a conqueror. The wife is a more than a conqueror. <laughs> That's what I mean. Right? We are more than conquerors. Right? So exciting, huh? So if God's interest is advanced, the devil will respond, it's okay. We, we are on the winning side, so we don't have to be too perturbed. But be prepared. Be, be prepared. Don't be so naive and think that, oh, you know, just because we are on God's side, then nothing will happen. No, there will be some conflicts. But we are assured of victory. Because the, the devil will not allow us to just continue to be where we are. So let's continue to pray. Lesson number four and last. We can learn lesson from Jesus' prayer. Right? How to pray, and then you can get an answer immediately. You know, there's an example in the Bible, and that is found in Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 to 46. It says this. Jesus, in the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He went on a little farther and bowed with his head face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, Could not you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they could not keep their eyes open. And let me stop here and then, you know, tell you about prayer. Prayer and sleeping are very connected. <laughs> Even with Jesus' disciples, right? You know why the disciples sleep? Or the disciples slept and then Jesus can pray? You know why? The answer is very simple. Because they are not the one going up to the cross. If they were the one going up to the cross, they also won't sleep. So when it does not burn us, we sleep. When it burns us, we pray. So how must I pray for my congregation here? That God burn you all. <laughs> 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 no, joking on it. See, sometimes, because you see, Jesus, it concerns Jesus. But for the disciple, Hokkien say, Look at Tai Chi. 
It's your problem. So that's why they, they, they somehow they say, you know, our spirit is willing, but our body is weak. But let's not use that as an excuse, right? Or I'm not reprimanding or, or, or scolding you. All. No. I, I want to encourage that prayer is actually hard work. It's not easy. Because prayer, you know, and when we pray, I think this is where the devil also works. You know, we will fall asleep. I, I can tell you this. Huh? Last time here, we have overnight prayer. Every quarter, we have one overnight prayer. We pray from about 10 o'clock starts, and then we end at 6 a.m. But then the problem was what? No, we turn off the light. See, 10 o'clock, you pray. One session, about one and a half hour. We have one session, then we rest half an hour. One session, rest half an hour, drink Milo, you know. And then we'll do that. We do about a few sessions. Then they switch off the light. Ah, yeah, this is where the trouble comes. So, so, you know, as you, early hour of the night, uh, or the, you know, then, or two, uh, one, two a.m., uh, then you suddenly will fall asleep. But then you don't want people to know that you are asleep. So what you do? After a while, you say, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So everybody, hey, I'm still in the game. Uh. I'm still in the game. I'm not asleep yet. Uh. But actually, be- between, in between, you are asleep. Uh. <laughs> so prayer and sleeping is, are very connected. <laughs> but let's be more vigilant. Right? Jesus, even the disciples experienced the same thing. They could not keep their concentration. They had their eyes open. And Jesus said, can't you, can't you keep watch with me for an hour? Then verse 44, so he went to pray a third time, saying the same thing again. Then he came to the disciple and said, go ahead. Ah, now, go ahead and sleep. Now, over already. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Now, what could we learn from Jesus' prayer? Well, Jesus prayed not once, not twice, but three times. Three times in this one instant. Right? So, if you analyze this prayer, first, Jesus prayed this. If it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Does Jesus know God's will? Jesus knew God's will. So he was struggling, right? He was just hoping as a man. Now Jesus here prayed as a man, not as the, the second person of the Godhead. No, Jesus prayed as a common man, as like you and me. And he struggles. He just knew the suffering of the cup, the excruciating, excruciating pain on the cross. Jesus knew. So Jesus struggled. If it is possible. Sometimes we pray, it's also many a time, it's more it's possible than anything else, right? Then you look at the second time Jesus prayed. Just see, you look at the slight difference here. My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it. You see the shifting of position now, right? No more if possible. Right? If cannot be taken away, your will be done. So now you realize that Jesus is willing to what? obey now. See, from starting position, struggling. Now, willing to obey. But not over yet. He came, and then he prayed a third time. The third time, he said, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Jesus got the answer. Right? But in between, actually, it says this. Jesus prayed the same thing again. The third time, his content of the third prayer is the same, I believe, although the Bible never says it, it's, it's the same as the second time content. Not the first time, because the first time was the struggle. The second time was a, a really a willingness, but Jesus needs a confirmation, right? It's not simple. You see, look at the struggle that Jesus went through. Jesus got the answer. You see, when he prayed, immediately, he got the answer. Sometimes we say, God, I pray, but you never answer me. Who says so? Here, the Bible never says that God spoke from heaven. Like, you know, when he got baptized, uh, heaven opened, and then there was a voice, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. No, no, no. Nothing of that sort. Here, Jesus got an in, inward assurance, right? He got up. He said, let's do it. The betrayer is here to take me. I'm prepared to go up to the cross. He got the answer. See, when he prayed, he follows the Father's will. So in this prayer, who changed? Did the Father change his will or did Jesus submit to the will? Jesus, actually in the starting point, would really love if possible. That change your will a bit. Right? So you see, prayer is like that. 
prayer is not changing God's will more than we submit to do God's will. That's prayer. So prayer is not all the time getting all that we ask. Sometimes we, 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 we feel that God did not answer our prayer. No, it's because you have not heard God correctly. Because if God answers based on what you ask, you may be in more trouble than you are blessed. Look at Balaam. Right? Balaam is a classic example. God said, don't go and curse the Israelites. Because he was bribed. The, the king offered him money. Lots of money, by the way. Just go and curse the Israelites. And he, he asked the Lord, he prayed, God, did I hear correctly or not? Cannot lah. Cannot lah. Huh? One time also cannot. Lah. So he keep asking God. God finally said, you want to go? Go lah. Go and die lah. So he died lah. So you see, if you, if you are stubborn enough, and I'm stubborn enough, and then we pray and keep on seeking when it is really against the will of God, we will end up suffering at our own cost. Nothing to do with God. But if we know God's will, because God knows best, right? We have to believe that God knows best. So even now, you feel that God is not answering your prayer because you did not answer according to the way you like it. It may be better that way than when you like it. Because if you like it, it may spell more trouble than anything else. So we have to have that maturity. Right? So let's learn to learn, talk to God. And Jesus got the answer immediately. And God did not change, but Jesus changed. So I hope that in prayer, we have this maturity to know that many a time after prayer, we change. Not God change. Right? Then you will have more answered prayers. Amen. Amen. So I hope that, you know, we, we have a clearer understanding about what prayer is. Talk to God first before we talk to anybody else, right? And we can check with other people, which is good, oh, but don't forget to communicate and talk with God first. And make, don't make prayer our last resort. Make it our first priority. And, and with that, I want to bring the service to a close. Shall we all stand and...